So if they have uh, some gnarly disease or whatever that can be spread by droplet transmission, then every time they sneeze, cough, laugh, talk, they're giving a death sentence to everybody else in the room as well um, with the amount of droplets that are being produced by that. Um, so disease agents uh, that travel short distances are not considered airborne. So we'll see the difference between droplet and airborne in a second. Um, examples of these kind of diseases that are transmitted by droplet is going to be the flu, pneumonia, and pertussis, which is commonly known as whooping cough that children can get. Um, so those are all, somebody sneezes, it flies through the air, and then it lands and it's done. Now you can pick it up if you were to touch that surface, but that's as far as it travels. It doesn't continue floating through the air. Another way to transmit diseases is vehicle transmission. So this means that it uh, uses something else in order to uh, continue uh, continuing to spread. So we have uh, waterborne, foodborne, and airborne. Um, so waterborne um, transmission, uh, obviously spread by water. Um, contaminated or untreated or you got yourself into some sewage which is disgusting um, so a disease that's transmitted by this route would be cholera which is a horrible uh, intestinal disease um, so that would be an example of waterborne so pathogens got inside the water you drank it now you have the disease foodborne um, things that aren't completely cooked you didn't refrigerate them well, you didn't prepare them very well. Um, obviously, pathogens can live in there. This is why they talk about, um, you know, certain meats have to be at a certain uh, internal temperature when you cook them because at that point you're killing all the bacteria within, within them. If you don't cook them to that temperature, you can risk getting sick um, from that. So things such as food poisoning, tapeworm infestation, which sounds lovely, um, is going to be foodborne transmission. So here's airborne, and here's how it's different from droplet. So again, droplet, you sneeze, it goes through the air, it lands, it's done. Airborne can be a droplet that lands on a dust particle, and then the dust particle can be up and carried elsewhere. So an example I was given when I was going through nursing school was like if you threw up a bunch of feathers into the air, the feathers would represent the pathogen and what it's attached to. So you throw them up in the air and you let them settle. They get on the ground and they land. But as soon as somebody walks by, it kicks them all back up again and they're able to travel through the air again. So that's the difference between airborne and droplet. Whereas droplet, again, it lands, somebody walks past it, it's not going to move again. It may smear, but it's not going to move great distances. Whereas airborne is going to travel some more. Um, so again, this is going to be somebody coughing, sneezing, um, talking, laughing, but it's going to land on something that's going to allow it to be carried elsewhere. Um, so viruses that cause the measles, tuberculosis, are airborne uh, transmission. Also uh, spores that are produced by funguses can do the same thing. Um, so again, um, they land and then they can get recarried into the air again. So vectors, like we talked about last chapter, same thing. So you have arthropods or in, in insects that harbor different diseases, and then they can carry it to a host. So there's two different ways that they can transmit diseases. One's mechanical and one's biological. Uh, mechanical is where um, you, uh, the insect just kind of walks across something and picks up the pathogens on its feet or on its body somewhere 
and then it turns around and lands again somewhere else, dropping off the pathogens. So a good example of this would be like a fly landing on maybe a dead animal that has uh, nasty microorganisms growing on it, and then that fly turning around and landing on your food, dropping off the pathogens, you consume it, and you get it. So the fly wasn't trying to be a bad guy. He just kind of picked up some stuff and dropped it on your stuff. Um, biological transmission is where the insect or arthropod is going to actually consume or get the infection within them, which may or may not cause disease, disease to them. And then they're going to turn around and bite or infect somebody else. Um, with it. So if a fly gets on a piece of meat that is infected, picks it up by ingesting it, and then takes it to you, well, let's say a mosquito, not a fly. So the, the mosquito picks it up, takes it to you, bites you, and the saliva and things like that um, get into your body from the mosquito. And now you have the disease as well. So things such as malaria that come from uh, or West Nile that comes from mosquitoes like that, that's going to be the biological transmission that we're talking about there. So why are carriers important reservoirs of infection? So let's break this down a little bit. So reservoir infection is where all the pathogens are kind of gathered and a carrier was somebody who had the infection on them, in them, and was giving it to people without actually showing signs and symptoms themselves. So they're not being uh, troubled or uh, their immune system isn't having to fight against this particular infection, but they are turning around and giving it to uh everybody else as well. Um, so these are like little Trojan horses, except they as the Trojan horse don't even know that they're spreading this all around. Okay, so that is basically principles of diseases. That's how they work, how they're transmitted, how we classify them, things like that. Um, basic definitions of things. So that's what diseases are. So epidemiology, we'll look at this and see what, what this means. This is definitely a shorter part. And then again, um, we'll be done in just a little bit. So epidemiology is uh, the science that studies when and where a disease occurs and how they're transmitted to the populations. Um, so an epidemiologist is going to look at all these different factors. So in today's crowded and overpopulated world, in which frequent travel and the mass population and distribution of food and other goods are a way of life, diseases can be spread rapidly. The contaminated food or water supply, for example, can affect many thousands of people very quickly. And being able to identify the causative agent of the disease um, is desirable so that we can effectively control it and treat it. And then it's also good for us to understand the mode of transmission and how it's distributed. Because um, you can't fight it if you don't know how it works. Um, so epidemiologists not only determine the etiology or the cause of the disease, but also identifies other possible factors um, concerning how it affects people. So uh, epidemiologists are going to assemble and analyze data. And it's also important for them, uh, for the prevention of future outbreaks, is the knowledge of the site at which the susceptible host came in contact with the infection agent. So um, if the common source is a water supply, then it's good to know that that, that is the source of infection and you get control and clean up the water supply.